Thank you so much. Uh, and I would like to thank Tom and the whole team at OpenGeoHub, and of course, express my honor to speak after Jana. I mean, Jana is a friend, but also a person who has managing Geo Secretariat in a fantastic way. And I really urge you to join activities with the Geo Secretariat. And I know in this project, we are particularly interested on, on issues like LDN. We have Baronor today. So this is real, real, I mean, for me, it's an honor to talk after Jana. Jana, and by the way, just to clarify, I mean, it's absolutely, given that the Open Data Cube is, is basically an X-ray, uh, it is clearly, Jana is correct, possible to run uh, the Open Data Cube as a backend to OpenEO. I mean, of course, the technically speaking, the details go after, but let me just go back to my presentation. So uh, you see a word, which is not your everyday word. It's uh, like the French say, it is a portmanteau. portmanteau. So it's an agglutination of global and local. And you see that. But before that, first of all, there is a strange person here in front of you. It's called a user. A user, because you know me somehow as a developer, but perhaps my most important role in the society is being a user of data and a policy decision. But a user also has users, you know? So, of course, this is a user, Pope Francis. So Pope Francis actually said, we need to protect the Amazon rainforest. And I happen to be a classmate in engineering of all places, in electronics engineering of uh, a person that graduated with us and went to become a bishop. And he's one of the most important bishops in Brazil, Don Dimas Lara Barbosa. So I asked Don Dimas, how does Pope Francis know the Amazon needs protection? And uh, Don Dimas said, of course, it's your data, Gilberto. Which means there are hundreds of millions of Christians who believe in the Pope, right? But I hope, I'm sure there are not so many millions of people that Pope believes in them. And I'm one of them, right? So the Pope believes in our data. And why does the Pope believe in our data? Well, the Pope believes in our data for two important reasons. First, it is transparent. First of all, it's the longest running Earth observation time series of anything anywhere in the globe. Consistent over 30, uh, 34 years since 1988. And not only is it transparent, but it's authoritative in the sense that it is used by red funds. So the Norwegian government and the German government have given, or have now they withheld the money, but let, that's explain why they withheld the money. They had given $1.3 billion to Brazil on the condition that deforestation goes down. Now, which data would the Norwegian government use to measure if deforestation is going down and pay to Brazil, our data. So our data is worth some billions of dollars. And the Norwegians believe us as well. No, they not never questioned our data. The data is used by Brazil's NDC and it's more than a thousand papers, okay? That's the interesting story. But 2018 comes a piece in The Guardian and I didn't make this up with Gert but it looked like we had the tele telecommunication by our hands because the Guardian says there is a vast expense of rainforest lost and it's triple the official rate from EP. And that's the data from guest Global Forest Watch. And then I call Matt Hansen, come on Matt, this can't be true, what's happening? And then back and forth, and the mail, da 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 da, and you know, after some, you know, he, sometimes I can be rather nasty, not in purpose, but in this case it was. What happens? We define in Brazil for 36 years, 34 years, deforestation clearly. It's the complete removal of primary forest cover. Okay, clean. Global Forest Watch, as you have seen the famous 36 examples, it's tree cover loss measured from one year to another. 
one thing is not the other. You cannot claim on the basis of tree cover loss that you are measuring the removal of primary forest carbon. But in the end, it was what the Guardian, the New York Times, Le Monde said. So after some nasty exchange of emails, finally Global Forest Watch puts a disclaimer on their website saying PRODIS, which is the resilient system, focuses on large clear cutting of primary forests in the Amazon while UND data captures loss in all tree cover, including loss in secondary forests. What does it mean? This means in clear English double counting. Why double counting? Because if you capture primary forest loss, okay, once it's lost, it's lost. No more. 100 years to get back the biodiversity, lots of emissions. If you count removal from secondary forest, you're counting the same area of trees which have been removed before completely. So you see this great variation here. Now, don't misunderstand. And if, since I'm here, I share your belief that global maps are important but they need to be understood. They're self-consistent. Let me understand, you have to be careful about they're self-consistent. They're consistent with themselves. So, when I talked about global, what does global mean? A map can, are the maps globally trustworthy? Do they deliver what they claim to deliver. That's one thing. The second thing, are they locally relevant? Which is a completely different question. And in this case, it's yours truly with President Dilma Rousseff and the environmental minister. That's how, by the way, another set of users. We're discussing Brazil's NDC in 2015, based on the data. Of course, for the president of Brazil, you have to present the data which is locally relevant for the president of Brazil to decide what she is going to present in the Paris Agreement. And that's not Global Forest Watch, I can tell you that. So the question of local comes, it's very important, and I'm going to argue from a land use perspective that the critical, descript, critical distinction that any land use map needs to make it's this distinction between what is a natural landscape, what is a man-made landscape. And of course, these things vary, but in some cases it's quite clear. The Brazilian Cerrado, which is an area of two million square kilometers, it is one of the world's biodiversity hotspots, and it looks like the left side. That's a natural Cerrado. Now, the right pasture, cows, one of the major sources of deforestation and loss of natural vegetation in Brazil. So if I am doing public policy, it's absolutely necessary for me to distinguish what is natural, what is artificial. Because for example, this is, a page, this is the work Hof, uh, which is here, helped to do land use and land cover maps where we separated natural from man-made. And based on that, we could and other people do as well, it's not only us, and do policy analysis. What's the impact of the public policies and soybean and pasture expansion in Mato Grosso, which is one of the world's bread baskets. It's the, uh, one of the places where it produces more soy in the world and more meat in the world. And of course, pasture expansion means that you map pasture. Now, let's take another one. Is a world cover map. Again, I'm going to argue it is self-consistent. Is it locally relevant? Bang, let's see. On the top, same area in the Cerrado is a world cover map. On the bottom, map, recent map on the Cerrado that Hof did in his PhD thesis. What you can see, some classes match the natural hard greens, which is the woody savannas. Now, everything in yellow in the world cover map is 
called grasslands. If you look at the Brazil map, one side of that river, this side, has been occupied by pasture, where the left side is mostly natural cerrado vegetation. The green areas is cerrado, and then open cerrado, which is the real open area. So, Doctor, would you mind wearing this? No. Thank you. So, there you have it. It's not that the world cover map is wrong. It is self-consistent in, in its own terms. So sometimes Tom was complaining that I said, oh, this is useless. Maybe I misplaced the word. Useless in the sense that for a user in Brazil, it is not relevant to me. It does not provide the information I need. So now let's take one bad example from a good place. Uh, Radiant Earth is actually a very nice place. It's actually a geo associate. And they have very nice data sets, training data sets for Africa. But they decided to go one step further, and then things got in trouble. Why? Because they decided to do a comprehensive legend for all their data sets for Africa. They had a data sets for Mali, for Kenya, and of course, in Mali, they have certain types, Kenya certain types, which is all fine. Now, they come up with six cover types. Water, artificial, bare ground artificial, bare ground natural, snow ice permanent, woody woody, non-woody cultivated, and non-woody semi-natural. Can someone explain what is a semi-natural landscape? Right. Now, Question, does it have to be hard? Yes, and that's the curse of Babel. It's in the Bible. <laughs> the Lord confused the language of all the earth, Genesis 11.9. You don't have to be a Christian to believe in the curse of Babel because it's among us. We are, Tom, you will live your life bound to the curse of Babel. You may try Esperanto, but I don't think Esperanto will work. Okay? Now, welcome to the team. The only comfort I have is that people much smarter than me have looked at the problem and did not find a solution. There's a long tradition going back to Plato Plato was an optimist who believed in the theory of forms, and Plato said the words implicitly describe the properties of their reference. This is a very optimistic assessment because it says, well, there's a word, table, there's a reference, this thing here, and Plato believed that the word described the reference. And then, if you go to Frege, Oberzinum Bedeutung, Frege dis distinguished between the meaning and the denotation. And there's a long tra philosophical tradition, who, of course, adds up to Wittgenstein, who, in his philosophical investigation, says the meaning of a word is its use in the language. The Wittgenstein was completely radical in regards to Plato and says meaning is what the use we make out of it. Now, don't get nervous if you cannot solve the conundrum, for example, the radiant earth try to solve, or if your deforestation doesn't match my deforestation. You know, Plato couldn't solve it. Frege said it's hard, and Wittgenstein said it's even harder. If you think of what, what Wittgenstein is saying, he's saying, give up on that. The meaning is the use. I'm not smarter than him other than Plato. So our real problem in land use is that we have words. And we use words to refer to objects in the world. Right? We say urban area, agriculture, forest, savanna. But in fact, the problem really is 
that the properties in the world are not binary. They are a gradation. And therefore, the gradation of properties in the world means that we have a small number of detectable uh, categories, especially more if we're using Earth's observation, because we're limited, we don't have the plots, we're limited to what the satellite can say, so we say, oh, 10 classes, it's the most we can do, and we're trying to map the whole conundrum, the whole continuity in the world into these small boxes. It is not going to work, so don't be frustrated. You're in good company of Plato and Wittgenstein, so at least have, and of course, God that said that you were cursed by Babel. One more example, if you're not convinced yet, this is Cerrado in Brazil, Brazilian savannas. Uh, it's similar to the African Cerrado. It's only that the megafauna that existed here uh, was not, I mean, when men started in Africa, the megafauna was there, and there's some megafauna there, the elephants are there. There were megafauna in Brazil when the people came from the north 14,000 years ago, they killed all the megafauna. So we just have the Cerrado. Now, what is savanna? It is actually a continuum. If you think about gradient of vegetation, height, and biomass, you see that you have a continuum ranging to, you know, wooded savanna, campo cerrado, and neither of this. But, you know, if you look the map, the world cover, it's actually more or less here, it puts this on the same category as a forest. So it's a wooded savanna would be the same as the Amazon forest, which is not. And then the rest is grasslands, including pasture. Well, welcome to the problem. It's unsolvable, okay? There's no solution. Now, there are different approaches to things. So given that the problem is hard, there are different solutions. In our case, my case, and the team I work, we have a vision, which of course has to be completely different from the European vision. Our logic is the logic of empowerment, especially empowerment of people in developing countries. We don't have the resources the European have, but we know what we have to do. We have to empower end users. And we have to let the user do their job. That's why on this whole data cube exercise, we opted for bottom-up map production, not top-down map production. We all, our approach was, I'm going to give the tool to the user for him to do the work. So it has to be as simple as possible, but it has to encompass the full power of Earth's observation. This means give users all the data. This means work with time series. Don't work with annual composites, best composites, season composites. Don't assume that you know better than the other guy. Give him access to the data, let him decide if you want to do an annual composite, a monthly composite, a 15-day composite. Don't decide on his behalf. You don't know much more than he, he probably knows more than you. So we built, we've been building since I was in Munster with Edza, and Edza is also a culprit for making me go to R. Edza now has some misgivings about R, but you cannot get away from your past, you know, your past follows you. So we developed an end user tool for cloud services. So it's, it's self-contained, it does not rely on anything else than itself. And because of Stack, it works on Digital Earth Africa, on AWS, on your computer, on Microsoft, on the Brazil Data Cube, on SIPO, on Tom's machine, wherever. And from Tom's machine, you can use this to get data from Amazon or get that data from Digital Earth Africa. Just takes a little bit longer, but you get the, day. the same script runs as you would run in AWS. That's what the end user do. And now it's TRL-8. And we also learned from the gurus of R 
like Edza, that any API should be short. So we have a, sh this is the essence, this is what we teach people from the earth science, our community earth science experts. So we tell them, look, there's something called a data cube and you create it with sets cube. There is something called ground tube with your samples and you get the samples from the cubes if you have the locations. There's something called a model and you train the model with your samples. There's something called a regular cube if you want to produce 15 day cubes, one month cubes and you regularize it. And there's something called a probabilistic cube that you get from classification. You can smooth the cube or classify. That's all you have to learn. Eight commands and you're on. So we have biologists, agronomists. It's not designed for programmers. Right. But what we've learned in the meantime is that humans have to be in the loop. And that applies not only to our package, to any package for land use cover. That's why I'm sharing this information with you. One tricky thing about big data is that, for example, these are 50,000 data points from the Cerrado, and they are four bands into a 15-day modus, which is 24 for a year. So you make the calculation, this is a 96-dimension space. How do you transmit the information from a 96-dimensional space to a user about the consistency of his data or her data? We use self-organized maps. For those of you who know what self-organized maps know, you know that the self-organized maps is a dimensionality reduction technique. And what happens here is that the neurons cluster, it's a very efficient cluster, because not only does a cluster, but it contains spatial information. You see, these are all these green, uh, greens are from a single class. The fact that they are together tells you something about the consistency of your samples. And the fact that you have, you know, this red guy here down, which is separated from his fellows, which are up there, that rings a bell. It's either a sample which is collected from a completely different place where the others, because the Cerrado has a, from five degrees south to 25 south, so that may be a gradient there, or it's an error, it's an outlier. You don't know. The algorithm has no way of knowing, it just tells the user, look at that data. The other thing we learned is that the user needs to be on the loop. What does it mean to be on the loop? It means that most classification systems, including Google Earth Engine or many of those, are what we call passive learning. So what is passive learning? You have a labeled data set, you have a supervised classifier, you produce a map. What is human in the loop? The classification is part of a loop. So you take the supervised classification and you say, look, there's some places here you need to improve. Give me some samples. Okay, then classify it again. Look at the classification, improve the samples. Let's look at one example. This is again, Rondonia, Brazil. We started, so I told uh, two PhD, two postdocs uh, in uh, ecology, and I told them, start with the classes that you're completely sure with. So they said, oh, we're completely sure that vegetation remains pasture and burned area and forest exist there. Bah, okay. And then we produce uh, that information there, which is the uncertainty map. Lo and behold, huge amount of uncertainty. If you look up, this was a reservoir. They forgot to put water. And then the system tells, these are the points that you should include. They are highly uncertain. In this case, it was simple to go to the next part because this was water. Fine, round two. Uncertainty almost removed, but close to the area which this is water has a fire. There's an eye of a high uncertainty. Why is that? This is the pulse. Areas which are flooded part of the year, 
in which are non-flooded, so the water, which actually means a certain thing, if it's water all the year, is different from areas which are, so you need now to have a category of wetlands. And up there is another vegetation type which was not there, so go and get the next round. So the baseline of all that is that you increase significantly your explanation power and the users learn what are the possibilities which are available to them. Because you are in the loop and the system is telling you there's eventually you come up, that's the best I can do. I cannot do better. Which brings us the, the two final slides, which is, well, 95% of the people on earth who do land use classification use decision trees. Okay, either decision trees proper or random forest. And that's what I would argue 85% of 90% of Google Earth Engine use. Problem with, with the random forest, it's a hierarchical model. At each point, the model takes a decision where to go for. And this decision, of course, favors the classes which are more likely to appear. So random forest guarantees you a good overall accuracy. But you may have classes which are less representative in the data set that random forest by definition cannot get. And that's where you get these transformer models. If you heard of DOE or GPT-3, this is all transformer based. There's a paper, if you want to delve into to call attention, is all you need written by Google who started the whole transformer resolution. Transformers are simple to understand. They, but very hard to <laughs> implement. But essentially, if I have a sentence like, look at all the lonely people, and I want to translate it. The problem is, look and people are the crucial parts of the sentence. All day doesn't do anything. So I need to relate look and people, and that's what DOE does and GPT-3 does. In our world, what happens is I'm relating observations. So for corn on this data set, the red band, there are two places, two time points in the red band time series, which are particularly related to corn and negatively related to soybeans. And in the end of the cycle, because we replace corn with soybeans, of course, these later on are more related positively to soybeans and negatively to corn. So end result story, you may not get a better overall accuracy if you use transformers, but you certainly get the best you can get of user accuracy and producer's accuracy over less frequent classes. So, going up. Prodis has been called the gold standard. The gold standard is by WRI, not by me. This is what we got with only 400 samples and transformers, which means one of your deliverables, don't tell it to Irvin, neither to Patrick, but you have one of your deliverables of tropical deforestation monitor ready. You cannot get better than this. You cannot better, get better than 90% of the gold standard. That's it. Thank you very much. Yes. So, Roberto, we have a number of questions for you that were submitted through Slido. Um, let's start with this one that has four votes from Patrick. It says, was there any account of widespread secondary forest removal in the Amazon during the years where GFW stats spiked? If so, what were the drivers? Good question. Um, it has to do secondary vegetation. Uh, it may be a coincidence because secondary vegetation in the Amazon is actually a defect of uh, poaching. What happens is the guys that cut the forest are not the farmers. These are organized crime which poaches the land. So they go there, they cut the land, and then they go up in the legal registry to buy ownership of that land. And they, and depending on the land price and depending on the economic price, they may have two or three years before they actually sell the land. In those two or three years, there may be growth of forest, enough to get a response uh, in global forest value as what well, as trees. So it, it's, I would argue, it has, it has a, it ha may have to do with the algorithm, but 
For me, it's more likely that has to do with economic cycles. That's how. It, that's what I would be tended to, because the guy would. It's it's a, it's a, it's a land grabbing land price story. We no, not produce. We have a, another product called TerraClass, who tracks land use after secondary vegetation. So, so another product, which is a companion product, but we found out secondary vegetation in the Amazon is very much related to poaching and to land pricing, currently. Great, yes, so um, our other one with four votes is also from Patrick. Um, should we abandon categorical maps completely in favor of continuous variables from which to dynamically drive maps matching local requirements? <laughs> I don't have an answer. I, I, my, I only have a guess, Patrick. I think no, because the, the use of the words, we need words to communicate. I need to tell the Pope about deforestation. So he would not, you know, if, no, but I'm, I'm joking with the Pope, but Macron and, 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 and Bolsonaro and who helps you. So they understand words. That's what our mind works. So I'm afraid that we, at least for the moment. Great. Okay. Um, we have a couple more questions. So um, how, can, how can end users use SITs to produce globally consistent maps, for example, climate change modeling? Well... To be quite honest, here, no, you, we have not tested SITs in, with the tested SITs at Amazonia scale, two million square hectare, three million square kilometers, three million square kilometers, which is big enough for us. We have not tried to run SITs in globally consistent, and we, well, first of all, we would not do it because we're not in the, we do, do not understand the others. We had trouble enough by trying to do Mozambique. So we went very, Mozambique asked us to do using SITs, and we we're very confident because we had good results in forest in Brazil, Mozambique would be a piece of cake, and we went like, Bam! because everything we knew about forest had nothing to do with how Mozambique works. So it took us months of work to the Mozambique guys to try to understand what did they mean by forest. So it's hard enough to do Mozambique and Brazil. I'm not, I don't, I'm not, that's why I appreciate the work of people who do this uh, big climate maps. I think they're useful. Again, the point is they are mostly self-consistent. Okay, we got a lot of questions. So let's just ask two more. Um, one from Tom says, should we stop mapping land cover classes and instead focus on more robust variables? For example, traits of biological species, crop types, canopy height, DBH. The problem here, Tom. It's the same question as Patrick. So okay, go ahead. Another one. All right, we'll move on. Um, oh, I was thinking, yeah, Joan. Um, ARD and DRI got popular, but in your talk, give data to users seems to deny the convenience of ARD and DRI. Is it? Well, no. I mean, uh, to one, I, what we rely on is that the data which sits on Amazon, Microsoft, to DS is, is ARD. So basically what we give to the users is say, okay, you, you are Amazon, get this collection in Amazon, and you select, you do like you do in Google, select the space and select the time, and select the how many days you want the information. So if you want a one day, one, one month cube, two months cube, 13 day cube. So we rely on the existence of analysis ready data, which is true for most data of interest to land use and land cover. May not be true for other kinds of work. Okay, let's ask one last question. Sorry, it's a very popular talk. So um, the last ones can get moved on to the discussion forum. But um, one anonymous question, does the selection of additional training points proposed by SITS lead to overfitting? How did you cope with this? Okay, good point. I mean, overfitting is, is one a dark art. And anyone who's worked in, in deep learning will tell you this is a dark art. Uh, you can get overfitting two different ways. One is if you start selecting, like you go 50,000 samples and then you try to sort out what's good and what's bad, you may have overfitting there. You may have overfitting if you go step by step. Uh, we tend, in our experience, is that we have a mixed bag. Some agricultural guys like to say, 
I want to separate soy corn from soy millet, from soy cotton, and I want to see if you separate. I mean, there's overfitting, I can tell you, it's what we try to tell them is that if you run a random forest, you get your baseline. So you get, if you get 85% overall accuracy in random forest, and if you run a deep learning model and you get 95% accuracy, you're in trouble. Don't believe the result. That's how we, we, we tell them, run a random forest baseline. And then the best you can achieve in overall accuracy with the current technology, with the same data sets, is 2%, 3%. If you got 10%, that's overfitting. Don't believe it. All right. Uh, that's all we have time for for now. But